Hello, welcome to RetroCore, and yes, we are back. And this time around, we're going to be taking a look at the MSX computer, or to be precise, the MSX2 computer. What is an MSX? Who made it? Where was it on sale? Well, let's take a look at the details. MSX2 MSX was an attempt by Microsoft and ASCII of Japan to standardize home computer architecture. The MSX format was first announced by Microsoft on June 16th, 1983, and marketed by Kazuhiko Nishi, the then Vice President of Microsoft Japan and Director at ASCII Corporation. The MSX platform was extremely popular in Japan, as well as many other Asian and European countries and Brazil. It is difficult to estimate how many MSX computers were sold worldwide, but eventually 5 million MSX based units were sold in Japan alone. Despite Microsoft's involvement, the MSX based machines were seldom released in the United States. MSX spawned four generations between 1983 and 1990. The first three were 8 bit computers based on the Z80 microprocessor, while the final MSX Turbo R was based on a custom 16-bit R800 microprocessor developed by ASCII Corporation. In total, around 30 different manufacturers produced official MSX hardware, with countless knockoffs also available. Today we'll be taking a look at the Japanese-only Panasonic MSX2 FS-A1, an MSX2 computer that was marketed mainly as a game system. Either available in black or red, this sexy looking MSX2 is one of the nicest compact models. Looking around the system we can see two standard 9 pin joystick ports that are not compatible with the mass system or mega drive pads. Around the back we can see the printer out, tape connector, analog AV out, RGB video out, channel switch, RF out and power input. Over to the far left we have the second cartridge port which can be used for games or hardware cartridges. The Panasonic FSA1 comes with the first version of a well-known Panasonic Desk Pack software. It contains such features as a clock, stopwatch, alarm, calendar, calculator and memo pad. Two AA batteries need to be installed into the MSX2 for these functions to save any data. As with the MSX computers, there are also many designs of MSX control pads. All feature two independent fire buttons and some feature rapid fire. My go-to pad is this Hudson Soft Joycard Super 2. A system would not be complete without its games. MSX games came on a variety of formats, being tape, disc and cartridge. Cartridge was probably the most popular format in Asia. Games came in soft clamshell cases. MSX cartridges all feature a hole in the casing. This was used to lock the cartridge into place on some systems or other accidental cartridge removal protection features. As you can see, this particular game comes with a black and white manual. The case also features a plastic pouch to store the manual. Sadly damaged on this game. MSX2 So there you have it, a little history about the MSX computer. So what about games? Every platform needs some good games to be successful and the MSX had tons of them. So let's take a look at some of the games in action. Many of us think the first Alesta game was on the mass system, and you'd be right. You may even only know it under the name of Power Strike. Truth is, Alesta had much more exposure on the MSX2, with this game being ported from the mass system, with quite a few improvements including an introduction, cutscenes and new stages. There are three Alesta games on the MSX2, with Alesta 2 being the best and most impressive. I really wanted to show you that, but try as I might, I just couldn't get it to run. Still, that's okay since the premise of all Alesta games is the same. 
lot of fun comes from experimenting with all the different weapons you have and seeing just how powerful they can get. Practically every single kind of shooter weapon is present, from lasers, homing missiles, options, wave cannons, they can all be found in some form or other. Collecting power ups is actually one of the best strategies in an Alester game. Every time you pick up something, you're granted a split second of invulnerability, which is sometimes necessary to wade through all of the projectiles that are tossed at you. The Alester games may not be ideal for people new to the genre, but for those who think they're hot shit on cave bullet hell shooters, should try out Alester on the MSX2. It sure packs quite a challenge. Contra is considered to be one of the best, if not the best, running gun shooter on the NES. But did you know that Konami also ported it to the MSX2? As you can see, the game doesn't scroll like the NES version, which really does affect the gameplay. However, I do like the way you can cheat by running off screen to avoid the enemy, only to return to have that enemy vanish. This is pretty cool, but also a downfall of the game. You see, Contra on the MSX2 is extremely easy. It also has no continues, but it's not like you would really need them. Still, the game does hold some merit. This version contains 19 stages, with the first 9 being based upon the arcade version, while the final 10 underground stages are entirely new to the MSX2. Contra is best with 2 players, but that's not going to happen on this version. This is girly block, yet there are no girls present in this game. What a strange title. So what is girly block? Well, on the face of it, it seems like another crappy effort from Telenet Japan, but when we dig a little deeper, we can unearth a pretty enjoyable game. Maybe because it was actually developed by Compile. You start off with the ability to build your very own mech suit, with various abilities depending upon which legs, torso and arms you choose. While there are many games like this, most of the choices you make in those games doesn't make a difference, unlike Girly Block. There's quite a bit of strategy involved in choosing the right parts for the right battle. Some areas that you battle in may require you to jump, while others may call for a projectile that arcs. Konami's Mystical Ninja's second ever outing was on the MSX2. In this game, Gambaragome and Karakuri Dochi. Based upon the Famicom original, which came a year earlier. This game revolves around the main character, Goemon, and his exploits. Unlike its sequels, this game does not feature the comic situations and strange characters that later defines the series. And Goemon is portrayed as the noble thief rather than a plain hero. The game plays in a top view action adventure style, separated by stages. In each level, Goemon must find three passes in order to advance to the next area. Some of these passes are found in boxes, secret passages, or can be bought. Like the rest of the series, Goemon can be powered up if certain items are found or bought, which in turn can be lost after taking a few hits. Unlike the Famicom original, this MSX2 version has the option to be played in turns by two players, 
with the second player playing as Nezumi Kozo, which is the basis of Gorman's sidekick Ebi Sumaru. In addition, unlike the family computer version, the game has 6 more provinces with completely new levels after finishing the game once. I do like this game and it's playable without any knowledge of Japanese, as long as you don't mind a little trial and error here and there. Konami was a prominent developer for the MSS platform which resulted in many great and unique games, such as this one, Hinotori. This one came out in 1987 alongside the Famicom game with a similar title. In fact, both games follow the same story arc. Hinotori as you can see is a vertical scrolling shooter, but isn't your typical kind of vertical shooter. The stages are laid out like a maze, forcing the player to take different routes in order to find the door keys that will allow him to pass on to the next section of the stage. Fail to collect the keys and you'll be going around in circles forever. Once you manage to reach the end of the stage, it's time to take on the boss and man, do these move in some sporadic ways. Needless to say, they can be quite tough. With endless waves of shooters on the MSX, it's nice to see somebody coming up with a twist and one that I'm sure many of you will enjoy. Originally a Capcom developed arcade game, Higemaru Makaijima Natsu no Shima Daibokuen, man that's a mouthful, was ported to the MSX2 two and a half years after its arcade debut. Momotaro is back from the first game and now must set sail on the ocean waves, collecting keys from different pirate ships and using them to unlock each of the seven islands in order to gather clues and gain additional equipment which will be necessary in uncovering the greatest treasure known to man. What's really cool about this game over the original arcade is when you visit islands. You'll come across some very familiar Capcom characters, namely the zombie from Ghosts and Goblins and Cyclops. Cyclops can now throw fireballs at you making him an even bigger pain in the ass than he was in Ghosts and Goblins. Okinoteni El Giza no Fujin, or as it was known in English, King's Valley 2, the Seal of El Giza, is yet another offering from Konami and yet another very good and addictive game. The game consists of six pyramids, each with its own wall engravings and colour pattern. Every pyramid contains ten levels. The idea of the game is to collect crystals called soul stones in each level by solving different puzzles and evading or killing 
the enemies using the many tools and weapons available to unlock the exit door that will take you to the next level. It sounds simple, but believe me, some of the puzzles will have you scratching your head at times. That's not to say it's impossible, mind you, just that you will need to plan ahead, otherwise you could end up trapping yourself into a dead end. So what do you think of the MSX so far? Or the MSX2 I should say. Some pretty good games there, including one of my favourites, this one, Alistair, which was actually released on the Sega Master System but cut down quite a bit. But wait, there's even more to take a look at, so let's take a look at some more great games and maybe a few stinkers on the MSX2. Konami again? Holy crap, they basically supported the MSX. Now many will think Metal Gear was in fact originally a NES game, but that's actually not true. This is the very first Metal Gear and it was on the MSX2. In fact Hideo Kojima, the creator of Metal Gear doesn't even acknowledge the NES game, saying it's a poor representation of the original. Now I'm sure you don't need me to tell you what Metal Gear is. But for the one or two of you that's been living on Mars for the last 30 years, Metal Gear is basically a stealth action game in which you have to infiltrate an enemy base and rescue the hostages. Personally, I hate all that sneaking around, so at times I just like to run in guns blazing. The problem with that is ammo is in short supply, so out comes the trusty knife. Many think Metal Gear would be a pretty long game, but it isn't and it does suffer from an awful lot of backtracking and moments where you will have absolutely no idea where to go next. Still, once you know the route, Metal Gear can be breezed through in under 3 hours. Psycho World is an interesting side-scrolling action game from an unknown little game company called Hearts. Although initially released on the MSX in Japan, it was also ported to the Sega Master System and Game Gear under the title of Psychic World. In Psycho World, the gameplay is all about using extrasensory perception to levitate, set things on fire, shatter stone and basically just kill stuff. You play as a girl named Lucia, an assistant, 
at a secret laboratory, but some monsters have broken loose and kidnapped her twin sister Cecile. After taking it up herself to rescue her sister, she is gifted with a special headset that amplifies her psychic powers, allowing her to fight through the monsters and even walk on lava. Most of the western world has only ever played this game on the mass system or Game Gear, which is unfortunate. The most notable aspect of the original MSX game, the huge levels, were completely removed. The MSX2 version features 8 fairly large stages, most with a number of branching paths. Both of the Sega ports have drastically cut down stages with different layouts, which makes it feel a little more like a generic side-scroller. Furthermore, the MSX2 version begins with a ladder leading up to the sky, where you can see a view of the whole land. This cool little touch is completely missing from both the Sega versions. Psycho World may not be the greatest side-scroller out there, but I found it to be quite fun, and it's also one of the few disc-based games being shown on today's show. Quarth is an unusual puzzle shooter game that originated on the arcade. For the game ported from an arcade game, it does have quite an odd story. A weird and destructive phenomenon has turned gravity on its head throughout the galaxy, and the planets as well as asteroids and stars have been transformed into deadly blocks and are now heading towards Earth. A group of scientists prepares to launch Quarth, a pod-shaped ship especially designed to counter the threat. See, I told you it was odd. The goal of the game is fairly simple. Blocks of various shapes descend towards the quarth, which, which must shoot small square pieces and attach them to the moving blocks in order to fill them. Once a block is filled or its boundary is closed, the screen stops moving and the large block slowly disappears. The game doesn't feature powered ups per se, but coloured blocks occasionally appear and release various special abilities, symbolised by a letter, such as bonus points, a screen freeze, double score, or a powerful bomb that wipes out everything at once. Rastan Saga is yet another arcade port to the MSX2 platform and one that looks very nice at first glance. Well, that is until the enemies come onto the screen with their monochrome art. Funny how Rastan himself looks lovely, yet the enemies look like something from a ZX Spectrum game. The game, while based upon the arcade original, actually follows the mass system stage design, with a few little alterations to accommodate the lack of scrolling screen. Sadly, there's no final boss in this version, you just fight previous bosses again. It's also rather easy due to the limited amount of enemies on screen. Still, despite its shortcomings, I kinda like Rastan on the MSX2.
<laughs> what a title! Space Manbao. Konami sure knew how to pick them. For its time of release in 1989, Space Manbao had an arcade look that no other system offered. It truly was impressive for an 8-bit home computer. I've read reviews where people compare this to Gradius, but in reality, it's bugger all like Gradius. Well, okay, some stages do resemble Gradius a little. The powered-up system in Space Manbao is similar to any Konami shooter, whereby shooting groups of ships, or sometimes turrets, will result in the release of powered-ups with different effects, in identified by their letter. There's also a power bar at the top of the screen, which can be powered up to improve the firepower by collecting red icons. There's a full 20 levels possible, though this is mitigated by the fact that they gradually fade away if not renewed, and you'll lose 2 levels every time you continue play. Though there's no penalty for either losing a life or changing your weapon type between wide and normal shots. Of course, every great shooter must have options, and Space Man Bow is no different. In this game, the options have more in common with those of R-Type Leo than other Konami shooters. Up to two can be equipped with one above and one below your ship. You can also toggle the direction of fire between forward, straight, up or down, and reverse. Space Man Bow is considered to be the best shooter on the MSX2, and you know what? It might just be. Centuries ago, the war god Honduras banished Ushash, the supreme mother god, and threw the four pieces of her jewel into the wind. Wit and Kles, two grave robbers, are attempting to find the broken jewel to try and achieve one of the greatest discoveries of the academic world. Their adventures, controlled by you, will lead them to many strange places to fight many unusual enemies. There are five stages in the game, throughout the game you'll notice the emotion icons that when touched will change the emotion of your character. At the top of the screen you can see which emotion you have. You have to have the same emotion as the demon of the level to fight him. For the first level you'll need the emotion that's to the left, for the second level you'll need the second emotion, and so on. Treasures of Usash is not the best platform out there, but it does offer somewhat of a challenge for those really into their thinking platformer style of game. And there we have it, another load of great games and one or two stinkers for the MSX. And I'm sure you'll agree that Konami had some of the best sounding MSX games out there. But there are literally hundreds and hundreds of games on the MSX. And it wouldn't be fair just to finish the show there, so let's have a bit of a montage to feature some more good games and a few more stinkers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Sadly, we come to the end of this MSX special, Retro Core. In the next show, we'll be taking a look at the Neo Geo, so I hope you join me for that one. And don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, click on the little bell to be notified of all the new videos when they get released. Until then, keep on gaming and enjoy your games.